Holy Spirit today and the Holy Spirit will minister to you in a special way. We're finishing a series today, um, a series entitled Basic Training for Marriage. And today's message uh, is for married, targeted for married couples, but it's good for everyone, singles, widows, young people who want to be married someday. Hey, if you uh, desire to be married someday and are praying for God to, to bring the right person into your life, keep the notes today. You're going to need them. And, uh, and, uh, and instead of focusing on God bringing you the right person or trying to find the right person, I got an idea for you. Focus on being the right person that God wants you to be and let him bring to you who he wants uh, because he does a better job than you can. Amen. And so uh, today's title is More Understanding and Better Understood. This is the message about communication. One of the most important topics when you talk about marriage is communication. There are so many topics that we did not get to in this series. Some of them would be good to get to. Some of them would be inappropriate from the pulpit. But uh, I'm thankful today that we can talk and be real as we know how to be. A marriage series like this can be challenging for married couples, as it should be. And I want to thank you for listening to this series and allowing our pastoral preaching team to give the best we know in giving marriages tools to help keep moving forward. I want to give a disclaimer this morning on the very front end of this message. Um, here's my disclaimer. What I'm about to preach is something Kathy and I have struggled with in our marriage. We're better now in our fourth decade of marriage, but we still mess up sometimes. Marriages can sink, float, or swim depending on how well messages are sent and received. Marriages can sink, float, or swim depending on your ability to send and receive messages. The messages that you send and receive to one another. Kathy and I spent about three days with a married couple in another state. It's been several years ago now. We went to see them. I knew this guy in ministry. We happened to be near where they lived and called him, and I really liked this guy, and we uh, wanted to meet his wife, and we decided to spend um, three days with that. Now, looking back, I wouldn't have done that the first time. Um, you know, when you don't know somebody that well, probably a day would be enough, just in case things didn't go well, you know. But... Uh, We were inexperienced with that, and uh, we, I, during the day, him and I went golfing and had a great time, and, and Kathy and his wife went shopping and got to know each other and had a wonderful time, and everything was going great until all four of us went out for supper that night. And uh, him, by himself, was good. Her, by herself, with Kathy, was good. When the four of us came together, even when those two were on their best behavior with one another, it was still horrible. Horrible. Their marriage had so much communication breakdown that it was absolutely, for Kathy and I, so awkward to even be with them. Somewhere they stopped confiding each other. They walled off parts of themselves and withdrew emotionally from the relationship. Everything they did aggravated each other. Aggravated the other one. They coexisted and they lived together, but the marriage was so severely broken. We loved them, we prayed for them in private, and we couldn't wait to get out of there. The Apostle Paul gave some clear instruction to God's people in Ephesians 4.29. Don't use foul or abusive language. 
Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. In your outline, I put one of the most important skills we'll ever attain in life and in our marriage is knowing how to talk so our mate will listen and how to listen so our mate will talk. Families have different ways of communicating, and people bring those different ways learned from their childhood into their marriage. When Kathy and I got married, I didn't realize she was not only marrying me, but there was a whole lot of me that was attached to the Bowman way of doing things that she got to take on too. And I didn't realize when I married Kathy that she had a family and a way of doing things, and a way she grew up, and a way they tackled things. And, and it's not even about good or bad. It was different. And it was real alarming for us in the first couple of years in our marriage. Um, families have different ways of communicating, and you bring that to your marriage. My family, the Bowmans, engaged heavily in conversation. I mean, we full-on engaged in conversation. That's not hard for you to believe, if you've known me very long. And you, I mean, in my family, you had to work hard to get in a word edgewise when we started communicating. It would not be uncommon as my sisters, you know, and I'm the oldest, Tim, Tammy, Terry, and Tracy, and mom and dad, the six of us, having a family meeting, having a family discussion, hanging out in the living room, and get into a conversation. And it would not be uncommon for one of us to get interrupted and have people in our family talk over the top of each other. This was the culture in our family. We weren't dissing anyone. We were just passionate, excitable, engaged, and sometimes very short of good manners. <laughs> the good thing was that our family wanted to work things out before the conversation ended. We did not, I, I'm grateful, I mean, we have problems, but we, our family, thankfully, did not hold grudges. We didn't keep score or allow anything to go longer than a day. Our family did love each other enough that we could not bear for something not to be settled in a fairly short amount of time. But at times, the volume was elevated and the emotions ran, whoo, high. Now in Kathy's family, it would seem that I would be with her and her family and mom and dad and brother and, and everyone would take turns talking. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't even talk that much. They just enjoyed being together. <laughs> Words were few sometimes. I'm like, what's up? They were and are awesome people. I love them so dearly. But did not show near the emotion or manufacture even half the amount of words as one Bowman. <laughs> now, neither one of those styles were perfect nor were they necessarily always wrong, but they sure were different. So in your outline I put, in life, it's difficult to say the right thing at the right time. But it's more difficult to leave something unsaid in a tempting moment. Now I realize I'm not going to hear a huge amount of amens this morning. And I think you're wise. I want some of you husbands to know that I, on the side, have been paid a lot of money to say some of the things that I'm going to be saying today.
And though you're pretty silent today, I can hear sometimes the amens being shouted inside of you. Seriously, my encouragement would be to not be thinking, I sure hope they heard that one, and that you would be receiving what you need and give your spouse to the Lord. Because if you could have fixed, if you could could have fixed your spouse, you'd have done it by now. You, 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 if you've lived very long at all, you know you can't fix anybody. You can't even take care of yourself very well. It takes humble, obedient, surrendered men and women of God to give our spouses to the Lord and be the person God wants us to be. so that God can do what he wants to do in all of our lives. The moment you even get that figured out right there, you will be well on your way to better days. So we're going to start with five behaviors of non-effective communication. I want to give you five ways that are not effective ways to communicate. You ready? Number one, silencers. The silent treatment is a form of non-effective communication. It sends a surplus of negative messages and its destructive force is used to try and control, but it doesn't work. Being quiet and not overreacting can be really good, but quiet should never in a marriage mean silent. All right, we did pretty good with that one. Second, second non-effective communication behavior, appeasers. To appease somebody means to make them less angry or less upset by doing or saying things to please them and deciding it's not worth the effort to work through it. Appeasers say things like this. Here's what appeasers say. Whatever you want. Never mind, just go ahead and do what you want. Appeasers want to keep the appearance of peace, but there's no peace. There's no peace, but they want to keep the appearance of it. They usually have difficulty in expressing themselves, and they need to know, they need to know, appeasers need to know it is absolutely okay to disagree. It's okay. How we disagree is important, but disagreements are okay. Third. Oh, this is going to get good. (laughs) Third behavior of non-effective communication, accusers. An accuser is a fault finder who criticizes relentlessly and speaks in generalizations like, You never do anything right. Or, you're just like your mother. Oh, if you want to win points, do that one. (laughs) Accusers feel like that the best defense is a good offense. 
They're able to come up, accusers are able to come up with words that are hard to argue with and leave the other person usually feeling disheartened and exposed. They can be quick to speak with guns blazing and need to learn how, accusers need to learn how to pull back and breathe and listen and realize, accusers need to realize that once you say something, you can really never unsay it. Colossians 4 and verse 6 says, Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Number four, processors. The processor comes off as reasonable calm and collected, never admitting mistakes, and expects people to conform and perform. The, pro the processor says things like this, upset? I'm not upset. Why do you say I'm upset? They think, processors think more like a computer and can't figure out why people cannot just state the facts. Would you just state the facts, please? <laughs> Processors not only do not like emotion, they're usually afraid of it. Processors prefer statistics. Processors need to know that God gave us emotions. And although we should not be led by them or trust them fully, they are very real. And when we become emotionally mature, you know, probably all of us are on that journey. How do we become emotionally mature? Emotionally mature, we'll, if we're that way or we're in that journey, we'll be better at things like self-awareness. You know, some people have no idea how ridiculous they are. Don't say amen. But emotionally mature, mature people become more self-aware. They have more empathy. They are more properly motivated. They have healthier social skills. And they have an ability to express themselves more suitably. Some people have a tremendous way of expressing themselves but it's not very suitable. Socially unacceptable. Number five, diverters. These are people who avoid direct contact and direct answers. They're quick to change the subject or say, what problem? Let's go shopping. There's no problem here. Let's go shopping. Contr confront confronting anything would mean that the problem might lead to a bigger problem or a fight, and that could be dangerous, so they just avoid. Avoid. Diverters need to know that they're safe and that problems and conflicts can be resolved. Now, the next time you feel yourself not talking, being a silencer, or appeasing, or accusing, over-processing, or diverting, remember, you're most likely feeling hurt or stressed out about something. If your spouse is resorting to one of those styles of non-effective communication, you can help them by being what what they need you to be in that moment so the root of the problem can be worked on at an appropriate time. In your outline I put, here's a key, find a way to make a safe environment so you can both talk. I, I've been working hard, this is not in my notes, Kathy, so I'm, I may be getting off here because I have her approval on everything I'm saying today. No, I'm kidding, but <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, you know, I have been working harder the last few years. I have this 
Oh, I hate telling you this about me, but you probably already know it. That's the thing. Things that we want to hide, people already know. I usually enter into a conversation knowing I'm right. So if I can be serious for a moment, I'm trying to enter into conversations that her and I have once in a while, saying to myself, I might be missing something. I might not understand. Or try to put myself in her shoes. That's miserable stuff right there. But it's right. So couple with, couples with good marriages or improving marriages have more understanding for each other and they feel better understood. Thus the reason for the title. They're able to navigate through tough subjects they withhold very little from each other and have equipped themselves, they've equipped themselves to be able to resolve conflict. 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Good communication is built first on who we are and then what we do comes next. Good communication is built. It's built first on who you are. Who are you in the Lord? Who are you in your, in your journey of life with Jesus and in your maturing sanctification process? Good communication starts with who are you? So that leads us to three behaviors of effective communication. Three behaviors of effective communication. Number one, acceptance. Let's state the facts. Your spouse came to you with many unacceptable qualities. Let's just, let's just say it. Your spouse came to you with many unacceptable qualities. Some were known and some are still emerging. But you decided to embrace your spouse's blemishes, quirks, morning breath, and all. <laughs> and that's what we're supposed to do. Acceptance is not when everything gets 100% worked out because, hey, that will never be the case. You're never going to get everything worked out. Because you're part of it. Not on this side of the Lord's return. Not on planet earth till Jesus comes. We are a work in progress. You are, your marriage is, everybody around you. And you have this high-minded idea that, man, we are going to, get everything figured out and worked out once and for all, and then we're going to float into the sunset. <laughs> you're, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was too strong. You're well uninformed. Romans 15 is a chapter about living to please others. Paul said in Romans 15, 7, Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Acceptance is inviting God's grace to the marriage. Accepting your spouse 
is inviting God's grace to your marriage. We're not saying that all behavior should be approved of. There's some behavior that's out of bounds. We never tell anybody to get a divorce around here, but if you're being physically abused, you need to find a safe place until that gets healed. If your kids are getting beaten by your spouse, get some help. Get your kids some help. But Christians are to accept one another and not reject each other in a general statement. So second, three behaviors of effective communication. One is acceptance. Second is realness. Realness. The second behavior of effective communication is being real and not phony or insincere. It's way more than words. Love, love has an action plan. Now, I cannot tell you how these stats that I'm going to give you came about or how true they really are. I don't know how anybody could figure out what I'm going to say to you right now, but I have heard it so much in so much of my life and in, in marriages, uh, mentoring, counseling, marriage tune-ups and, and series and Kathy and I doing things together over the years and taking couples, many couples to a hotel and spending a couple, you know, a night and a day with them and pour into marriages. And we have done enough of that over the years. And I've heard this so much that it's, if it's even half true, it's worth me stating here this morning. So here's, here's what it is. It's been said that 58% of our communication with others happens non-verbally. 58% of your communication happens non-verbally. Tone of voice, your tone of voice makes up 35% of the message. 35% of what you say is said by your tone. And the words we actually say account for only 7% of the total message. And I'm like, wow. Realness, if we're going to have effective communication and we're going to be real, realness is expressed in our eyes, our tone our posture, our posture. I, I didn't realize how much our posture says a lot. We know exactly how to interpret our spouse's nonverbal communication. The greatest techniques in the world won't work if we're not being real with one another. All right, one more of these. Three behaviors of effective communication, acceptance, realness. Third, understanding. This behavior is so important because life looks different for your spouse than it does for you. We tend to think that everyone sees life like we see it. It's not true. What would happen if we decided to gain understanding from our spouse's point of view? I put in your outline, I put a lot of notes in your outline today. I wanted you to have this as a tool. Most of us are wired to either use our head more or our heart more. And it usually takes a conscious effort to fully engage both our head and our heart, into our marriage, our work, our parenting, and all of our relationships. I put in there, if we choose to have understanding for our spouse, if we choose to have understanding for ourselves, let's be forewarned. When we understand our partner's hurts and hopes, it will change us. Being able to see the world through your spouse's perspective will be a tremendous advantage to your life and marriage. 
We've talked about acceptance, realness, and understanding. Now I want to move to the last section of this marriage, or of this message today, and the last message of this series. And I want to talk about five respectable ground rules for better communication. Now we're going to lay out the practical ground rules. If we want to be more effective in our communication skills with our spouse, here's the first one. Are you ready? Boy, nobody's moving this morning. <laughs> Here's the first one. Don't say you. When we're upset, the natural tendency is to attack with saying things like, you drive me crazy. Or, you never ask me when you make an important decision. You. Why you? You! <laughs> Never say you. The natural tendency when being attacked is to be defensive. It's a protection mode. If we attack our mate, seldom will we get the response, yeah, you're right, I'm totally wrong about that. unless you're just saying it in a deceitful way. Typically, the you statements are returned like, you're the one that's insensitive. Or, did you ever consider the pressure I'm under right now? And when this all begins, it's probably not going to be a nice evening. Instead, consider saying some, something like, Say it like this. Don't say you. Say, I, I, I feel hurt and neglected when my opinion is not desired. I statements give out information to be understood rather than you statements that accuse and cause a defense. When we use I statements, Effective communication is much more likely to happen. I statements do not cause as much defensiveness, nearly as much, because they, they don't say anything about how bad your spouse is. Hey, attacking our spouse has no real benefit. But when we say, I was hoping that the plans we had for this evening were not forgotten, we might have better communication. Five respectable ground rules for better communication. Don't say you. Number two, really listen. Now, listen. Listen to me for a minute. Good communication is learning to listen. Hey, hey, I want to I wanna do something for you here. Hearing is passive. Listening requires being interactive and repeating it back to the sender. Hearing and listening are two different things. Guys, I'm going to get on you for a minute. I'm going to leave the ladies alone for a second. Guys, we sometimes hear more than we listen. Yeah, I heard you. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right already. Yes, honey. I heard what you said. I listened to you and I listened to your heart. I'm understanding. Hear, listen. That, that was worth the price of admission right there, right? <laughs> if Kathy told me when I came into the house, you're late for supper. Tim, you're late for supper. I, I may be tempted to retaliate by saying, if you had the day I had today, 
you'd not be on me about being late. You. <laughs> but if I could truly listen to Kathy beyond her words, I would hear and I would understand that she worked hard to cook a nice meal for the two of us to enjoy. And it hurt her when I didn't show up and the meal's left on the stove and it's cold. And I wasn't there to receive her gift of love. James says in James 1, 19 and 20, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Instead of hearing words when our spouses talk, we can learn to listen to what they're really saying. This means that our hearts will need to be engaged as much as our head, and then we've got a shot at real communication. And remember this, real listening involves change. If your partner is asking for change, Truly listening will give it serious consideration. Number three, ground rules for better communication. Don't say you. Really listen. Third, accept the differences. Women, by and large, use communication to form connections with other people. Men tend to use words to communicate their knowledge and skill and impart information. That's not always true, but many times that's true. Men and women, God created us, and he created us with some differences. The statement that I'm about to give you is another statement that's not 100% true, but more often than not, men tend to be more about solving problems, and women are usually more about understanding things from various ways. Married folks need to understand that both are needed. There's a time to process, and there's a time to make a decision. There's a time to understand, to hear, to listen, to get all the different facets of what's happening. By and large, I'm not trying to get myself in trouble, but by and large, women can be better at that. Men want to finish the conversation. They want to make a decision. They want to move on. They want to conclude. So men, know when your wife just wants to be understood and not fixed. And women, know when your husband wants to impart information and desires perspective more than he's wanting your emotion right then. Men, men and women were made different, and part of that reason was to fulfill the roles that we each have in a marriage covenant. We need to accept and embrace the differences. We need each other. God made it that way. Four, say I'm sorry when necessary, and it usually is. There are times when a simple, honest apology will totally cause things to be dismissed so that you can move on. We're not talking about saying this as a tool to be used to manipulate or to get, get us off the hook. Or, or we're not talking about a premature apology that blocks the real change that might be needed. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, moving on. We need marriages that can apologize and still embrace responsibility and accountability for our own behavior. A sincere, heartfelt apology can leave a couple renewed, relieved, and knowing that all is well. Last one. I think I need to put this one in here. Keep touching. Human skin has millions of nerve endings called touch receptors. And when we're touched, the, these receptors send messages to the brain. So I'm just going to keep it real here. We've been working at that all morning long. I'm just going to say it. When Kathy and I 
Or maybe when my wife has had a long, difficult day, and she does sometimes. She has a lot on her. And it's not always physical either. But when Kathy has a difficult or a long day, she's tired, and I give her a hug in the right moment, in the right way, I'm going to tell you what happens. Here's what can happen with just a little hug. A little hug. The hug causes a rise in hemoglobin, a substance of red blood cells that transport energizing oxygen throughout her body. This will cause a speeding heart to quiet, soaring blood pressure to drop, and pain to ease. Most young couples that are married, most young married couples hug and kiss and hold hands when they're together. Some marriages remain huggers and hand holders, and others kind of get away from it. Now, I don't want to go off the rails here to close this message, but this might be an important thing for a marriage to discuss. Some of you guys may not be kissing your wife. Get a breath mint. <laughs> Before you leave for work, take one moment, put your arm around her and pray a little prayer. Say, Lord, while my wife and I are separated today in body, I pray your blessings and protection on her. Thank you for a wonderful woman of God. I bless you. And before you walk out the door, reach over and plant one on her like you have it in 20 years. Just lay one on her. A double dog dare you. <laughs> and when she falls down to the ground in total shock, Pick her up and do it again. <laughs> Husbands, God made the woman with a sense that many times we don't have. I think I have five senses. My wife doesn't. She has six, seven, Maybe eight. <laughs> when you try to frustrate her with the facts, she has the ability to blow you away with passion and emotion. And when the facts are long forgotten, the feelings will still be there. <laughs> the average man has to say to himself, I must listen and listen well and not be caught drifting. <laughs> Husbands and wives, make some time this week to be more understanding and better understood. Stand to your feet. Lord, I pray for marriages right now. I pray that our marriages will, from wherever we are in the journey, wherever our marriages might be, from needing an overhaul to a tune-up, wherever in between, Lord, I pray, seriously, Lord, I pray for marriages to rise up and glorify you and to be an, a testimony of your goodness and grace in our lives. Lord, I know, I know as a pastor and speaking for the other pastors and elders in our church that marriages are under attack by the enemy in unprecedented ways. The enemy is out to destroy 
especially Christian homes and marriages. So I pray, Lord, that if there's something that was said today that would be a help, that husbands and wives would maybe find some time quietly to start discussing some of these things, not to fix one another, but to be the husband, to be the wife you've called us to be. I pray that there would be some value today in, in our time together. And that humility and introspection would be the order of the day. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to each of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings, everyone. You are dismissed. We love you in the Lord.